Randy, and uh, welcome everybody to Staten Island, New York. Uh, this is part of the uh, Avis Lecture Series, which we've been doing here in my dental office for, I guess, almost 15 years. Um, and Gina and I, as you will hear, have uh, we're in the third year of this uh, medical dental collaboration. And so uh, tonight, uh, we decided to share beyond the uh, boundaries of Staten Island. So uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, just a little bit about how this connection happened. Um, Kim and I were looking for significant cardiac prevention help. Um, Kim's dad died at 54 of a heart attack swimming in a pool. Kim is my wife. And, uh, and both my mom died ultimately of, uh, after bypass surgery and 20 years of battling cardiovascular disease. And we went to NYU. Uh, we went to a number of different places. And uh, I felt there might be more, and I was sitting with a dental colleague at a meeting, and I uh, said, you gotta read this book called Beat the Heart Attack Gene. I read the book, I listened to the book, and I called out to Nashville, Tennessee, and Dr. Pritchard answered the phone, and we made an appointment to come out to see uh, Gina and Brad Bale, Dr. Bale, who's the co-author of the book Beat the Heart Attack Gene. It was the finest medical experience Kim and I had ever had, um, and I couldn't get it out of my mind. After that point, I started asking some different questions about, of my patients, and I was looking for support in my community, and really couldn't get here what I was able to get with Gina and Brad. And so uh, with that, um, long story short, Gina said, I'll come to Staten Island and practice alongside you. And uh, so as we begin our third year together, that's what's happened. And I think, Gina, your story is really important, how you got into prevention of, of heart attack and stroke. Yeah, thank you, Victor. So 25 plus years, I was rounding in the hospital. First started out as an RN in the ICU, CCU, and then cardiac catheterization laboratory. We call it the cath lab. It's like the OR, if you will, but where the heart procedures are done, like coronary stents and things. So that was my world. And uh, when I first uh, graduated and went through the critical care internship, it was the late 1980s, and we were all so thrilled that coronary stents were about to uh, get FDA approval and be available for everyone. And of course, they, the coronary stenting uh, procedure has saved lives. There's no doubt about it. But fast forward uh, 25 years, this has been, we're like in the uh, not 2005, 2000, like uh, to, towards 2010 range. And um, I began to wonder, is there not more that we can do for patients? Because we've been stenting people now for a long time. And uh, they keep, when they come in for the first heart attack, they keep coming back for the second procedure, the next procedure. And, uh, but in 2005, what really, as you say, a pivotal moment struck me uh, that day is we uh, had put our eighth coronary stent in a patient, which is, we put way more than that in now. Uh, but that was the most we'd put in in this particular cath lab in a rural area in Texas. We're like, how many stents are we going to put in somebody? And how many times are we going to bring them back? And um, that was a conversation in the break room, and that same day, a 45-year-old patient presented to the emergency room with sudden cardiac death. That's where you're fine one minute, and then you're laying on the ground, and someone must revive you with CPR and AED, or your life is over. And too many times, that is the first symptom that people have that they have no clue that they have cardiovascular disease before that. But we've seen that many times before, but what struck me different that day is the fact that this 45-year-old male patient, his parents were patients of mine who had been in the hospital many times. I saw them in the clinic. And something about that changed me that day. I'm like, we've got to start seeing all the children. Okay, what age would we start seeing them? What would we do for them anyway? So I began to seek out prevention, and in 2009, I first heard Drs. Bradley Bale and Dr. Amy Domine speak at a luncheon meeting, and two things they said that day, I said, if this is true, this is going to change my practice, and indeed it has. And one was that, um, that the oral health is responsible for a great number of heart attacks. In 2009, we didn't have the data that we do now. Now we know that it's at least 40 percent uh, oral health issues are causal of heart attacks. But I wasn't even asking my patients if they brushed their teeth when I was discharging them from the hospital. So you can imagine how that changed my world. And the other thing was that small 
areas of plaque, atherosclerosis, little cholesterol buildup on the wall of the artery can be the most dangerous kind of uh, plaque, and we'll go over that one today. And by the way, Gina, in 32 years of dentistry, I've only had one time that a physician has asked to have dental clearance for one of their patients before surgery. Mm -hmm. So good thing is none of my patients ever need surgery. <laughs> That's what that must mean. Uh, Jimmy, I think uh, I'm gonna have to have you do it right now. Just because I want for me to change that. Yeah. Just, no, no, just move here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there might have just time uh, yeah. Okay. So Gina, why don't you just talk about the objectives yeah. of the evening? I want to say first and foremost that this webinar and this live event is for you if you are a medical or dental provider in the healthcare field of any kind, but it is also for you if you're not at all in the healthcare field. So we hope that a lot of people are listening. We know that there are some individuals here tonight that aren't at all interested in being in the healthcare field, either dental or medical. Uh, and this information is for you as well. It'll be life-saving for any individual because it's very hard to find someone who hasn't been impacted by heart disease. Probably everyone in this room knows someone who's had a heart attack or stroke, or maybe even a loved one, maybe even personally affected uh, by cardiovascular disease. Certainly, we all know neighbors and friends. It's just far too prevalent. So on this webinar, we're gonna talk about what does this type of preventive care mean for you personally? We hope everyone will have their own health in mind as we go through this first and foremost. And then secondarily, obviously we're gonna go through uh, if you are a medical or dental provider or seeking a medical or dental provider, what you need to look for in that uh, collaborative approach. So we're gonna talk about this connection. What is the connection between medical and dental? Uh, and cardiovascular disease 101, we call it. Uh, we know that all of what we're talking about tonight will reduce your risk of chronic disease of all kinds, but definitely heart attack, stroke, diabetes, and um, dementia, any vascular related events. So we're gonna go through cardiovascular disease 101, disease diagnosis, inflammation, and root causes, and then why this collaboration is necessary. And by the way, um, when, I, when Kim and I went to Tennessee to become patients, uh, there was a moment there that I realized that Dr. Bale and Gina appreciated the value of dentistry in terms of people's overall wealth, and, uh, overall health and wellness more than I ever had. In fact, most of my experience with medical professionals has been, you know, are they allergic to something or can we stop a blood thinner before a procedure? But rarely was I called in to be collaborative to save people's lives. And uh, when, when Brad and Gina just emphasized how much they needed people like us to become part of this, uh, it was really a fascinating moment. And so hopefully you'll see, you'll, you will leave here and understand more, but let me help you get a little uh, perspective. In 1840, um, there were no dental schools and a physician went to the University of Maryland and said, you know what, dentistry up to that point was a trade. It was done by barbers. And, um, and said, hey, we think that dentistry should now be part of the medical curriculum. And the physicians, part of the medical school, said to one of their own physicians, no, we don't want you. Uh, and so, but University of Maryland said, okay, we'll start the first dental college. So the first dental college in the world was at University of Maryland in 1840. By the way, the first dental school, uh, medical school was 1767 in this country at Columbia University, then called King's College. So it didn't start out on a great track that physicians and dentists were embracing each other. It was really, we don't want you. And then actually uh, later on, uh, dentists were kind of invited in and then at, by that time, dentists wanted their own autonomy. Um, but in the 1920s, on behalf of the Carnegie Foundation, William Geis um, came to the conclusion that dentistry uh, needs to be considered an essential part of the healthcare system and then in the year 2000, the former Surgeon General David Satcher said, we must recognize that oral health and general health are inseparable. So, um, you know, we're now 2019, so 19 years later, uh, Gene and I are standing in front of you to say, hey, it really is inseparable. Mm -hmm. uh, just to give some perspective, these are just a few books that, you know, I've loved recently, but they're, they're written by uh, dentists, um, they're written by uh, physicians, 
They're written by respiratory therapists, ENTs, PhDs. And so all of these books are thinking about kind of beyond the teeth. And those that are talking about the heart are saying, hey, how much the oral health matters. And so there is a lot out there that say, hey, this kind of collaboration needs to be not the exception, but the rule. And Gina, why don't we going to talk about just some of the people here that have helped get this word exactly. out. Exactly, and I think that this is just a few of the organizations that we wanted to mention, not only because they have led the way in terms of uh, bringing collaboration to all of the conferences, and some of the people that have started these organizations are the ones that are authors on the book that are really thought leaders in this area, but certainly uh, none more than Dr. Bradley Bale and Dr. Uh, Amy Doneen, but the AOSH and AAPMD organizations have been uh, preaching this message, if you will, for years, and they have a, uh, a seminar coming up in Nashville. And it's uh, called Collaboration Cures, mm -hmm. so they're bringing together medical, dental, myofunctional therapists, lactation consultants, midwives, just a, a host of people that are part of this healthcare picture. Mm -hmm. um, and, and by the way, I know Howard Hinden, and he was he was certainly instrumental in asking us to, to broadcast at a, at a bigger level tonight. Thank you. And, uh, and one of my mentors, uh, Bill Hang, is doing a course in, in March in Las Vegas, and, and he's talking about obstructive sleep apnea. And that orthodontist, a great, uh, from, uh, a great orthodontist from New Jersey, is here and has uh, also been influenced by Bill. But that orthodontics is not about straightening teeth, or it shouldn't be about straightening teeth. It should be about making people healthier and that orthodontics can have a significant impact on airway and breathing and oxygenation and preventing heart attack and stroke, and we'll bring that to light. And then another terrific orthodontist in this area, Barry Rayfield, has really been a leader. Um, he also is thinking more about health. He calls it airway orthodontics, um, and he and Mark Cruz have been doing an airway mini residency here in New Jersey, and he's doing a course now for orthodontists to hopefully get them on board. But oddly enough, it's, it is swimming upstream right now. There are a few orthodontists, am I correct, Greg, that are on board here? Yes. So, uh, Gina? Yeah, so one thing that I want to say is, uh, in getting into cardiovascular disease 101 now, is that we all um, plan on vibrant health to our last breath. We have plans to take our grandchildren out on the yacht. We have plans to uh, finish our mission. Maybe we have athletic endeavors that we want to uh, participate in. We have uh, goals, but one in three of us are headed straight toward a cardiovascular event. One in three of us in this room, uh, 35 to 38 percent of all Americans, all adult Americans have cardiovascular disease, whether they know it or not. And so uh, in all honesty, disability and premature death are in our future if we don't uh, do something about it. Heart attack and stroke still the number one killer. Heart attack, stroke, the number one cause of disability. And people fear stroke really more than a heart attack because we want our independence right up to that last breath, right? So is it really possible to avoid these diseases? Are heart attacks really optional? Are strokes avoidable? What about diabetes and dementia? So chronic disease is the target of our uh, conversation tonight, but you'll hear us talk a lot about heart attack and stroke, just to put it succinctly. But these techniques certainly reduce and reverse uh, someone that's headed towards diabetes uh, and uh, eliminate the uh, progression towards dementia as well. So how is that possible? The science is, we say the science is our secret sauce. Everything that we say tonight is founded on level A and level B evidence, meaning we've got scientific evidence to back up what we're saying. Certainly we have clinical uh, experience to back that up as well, but uh, it's without a doubt uh, the truth, if you will. And Gina, I just want to, you know, in one hour, I know one of the things mm -hmm. I wanted to say is, you know, we, we work so hard on getting hundreds of slides down to about 45, and no matter what we do, it'll never be as complete as we'd like it. So we ask for your apologies. But at the end, everybody who's registered will get all the scientific our article references, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, the educational opportunities that we just pointed out briefly. And so, you know, we want to support you in your learning going forth. Exactly. This is just a brief overview, as best we can do it in, in this short time. 
So the science says that the only way we're going to do it is through the partnerships of medicine and dentistry, merging, integrating our patient care to monitor arterial health, vascular health, and eradicate inflammation. This is really where our paths collide, if you will. And that's our only hope of taking heart attack off that number one killer spot or our only hope of living vibrant to that last breath without the disability of stroke. So why the collaboration, Victor? Well, you know, dentists, you know, this is my hygienist, Dawn, is here tonight, and Dawn's been taking blood pressures for, I don't know, I think 20 of our 25 years, maybe 24 over 25 years. So, you know, why do we take blood pressure? We're, we're trying to see, hey, does somebody have early signs of a risk factor for cardiovascular disease? But we've also been taking medical histories and dental histories. It's just, I think, in the beginning of my career, personally, I can say I was taking it to try to keep my tail from getting caught in the door. You know, if there was on a blood, if somebody was on a blood thinner, I didn't want to do surgery without checking with the physician. Um, I want to make sure they were stable so nothing would happen while they were in my office. But I think there's so much more opportunity. 20% of people see their dentist more often than they see their primary care physician. And I have to believe with the kind of urgent care centers and the doc in the box that the relational uh, primary care physician practice has really already changed. And yet in dentistry, there's still a, a good percentage. There's a lot of corporate dentistry, but there's still a significant percentage of of dentists that really know their patients, they know their families, they want to practice that way. And so we have a significant opportunity um, if we're educated to make an impact on people's lives. One thing I'd like to say about that too, Victor, is that this very week, practicing together in the office, you saw a patient back that Dawn, the registered hygienist, had identified high blood pressure in a year ago. And you know, referred them appropriately, the, the patient got on treatment, He's back for his routine follow-up, and Dawn identifies the fact that, hey, this blood pressure is too low now, or maybe it's too low. This needs to be addressed. And they had just adjusted his medicines, and so indeed, this fact that we could talk about it real time while the patient was there being in the, under the same roof is the life-saving kind of integration that is so exciting, but it's exciting because it's much better care for the patient. That old referral system is, uh, is archaic in our mind. Right. Thanks, Gina. So mm -hmm. this, is the, this is the point of connection. Right, inflammation is the point of connection. I'm gonna define inflammation a little bit better in the next slide or two, but just know that uh, inflammation is not a nebulous term. We can identify clearly if someone has inflammation and without a doubt, inflammation is the, the cause of chronic disease. So this is the Beldonine method pillar of um, a synopsis actually of the method, the method that is the most powerful, the premier heart attack and stroke, diabetes and dementia prevention program in the world, uh, scientifically uh, founded for sure. Uh, so on the pillar, we have starting first with education, which we're doing tonight. And we start first by making sure that our patients or the general public understand what is uh, an option out there, open their minds to how powerful prevention can be. And then secondly, we use D for disease. We want to know of this arterial system, these blood vessels that give the nourished blood to our vital organs, do you have healthy arteries or do you have diseased arteries? And what does that look like? We can monitor that every year to see if we're making progress, if everything you've done throughout the whole year is translating to reducing your risk of heart attack and stroke because your arteries are looking healthier. Then F for fire or inflammation, that is, uh, the main focus because inflammation is causes atherosclerosis buildup, plaque buildup in the arteries, and it causes uh, what leads to a heart attack, which we'll describe in just a minute. So we have to live in a, a life of reducing inflammation and keep a, an eye on it. Then root causes. So the sources of inflammation, many of them are oral health related. And so that's why this is where the connection really uh, occurs and hits home because there are so many uh, reasons for inflammation that the medical community cannot treat. And so the collaboration is absolutely So necessary. really in essence, Gina, anybody who can diagnose and manage inflammation in the medical and dental world needs to be part of the team. Yes. And uh, so it, it, we certainly recognize it goes far beyond, you know, a medical practitioner mm -hmm. and a dentist, but, um, but hopefully it's the beginning right here. Right, everyone is welcome and everyone is needed for sure, yes. 
Um, so the root causes need to be identified, some of which are oral health, some are otherwise. Um, and working, we work collaboratively, collaboratively together to not only diagnose, but to reverse those root causes and optimally manage those root causes, not for um, what is optimal or what we think is ideal for the general population, but precisely for you by using precision medicine and genetics to guide our decisions and recommendations. So the acronym is EDFROG. So if you hear us talking about EDFROG uh, in the Beldonine community, uh, saving lives together, we talk about uh, applying EDFROG or even use it as a verb sometimes. We're gonna EDFROG this patient, if you will, so to speak. And just one of the things, I mean, you say sometimes I wanna make sure I dumb it down for me, but atherosclerosis, uh, cardiovascular disease, plaque in the artery walls, they're all kind of synonyms. That's correct. Okay. Yes, and I may use the terms interchangeably. Yeah, <clears throat> so inflammation, we have known inflammation is the driver of chronic disease or is plays a role in chronic disease for many, many years, over 100 years, Dr. Virchow, what, 156 years ago, proposed that theory. Since then, it's been debated back and forth, but the focus, especially in the world of heart attack and stroke prevention, has been on cholesterol and getting your uh, cholesterol numbers down. But uh, more and more evidence has come out. We have numerous studies, uh, which you'll get in your email. But two years ago, uh, the CANTOS trial, we call, came out and ended the debate because without a doubt, we now have confirmation that regardless of your cholesterol levels, Reducing inflammation reduces your risk of heart attack and stroke. A drug called a monoclonal antibody was given to half the patients, and a higher dose of the medication, which reduced inflammation, uh, markedly reduced the incidence of heart attack and stroke, regardless of the patient's cholesterol level. So no argument now, and uh, a lot of those in the medical community who were still studying and, and focusing on lipids now say, wow, we have to admit there's a role for inflammation. Maybe it is the role in of course, Dr. Bale and Dr. Amy Domine have presented that science for years. And just, it's the truth. Just this, about an hour ago, we had a patient that was in here. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's two hours. And uh, she looked a bit distraught. She said that her mom had just had a heart attack. Now, her mom's got to be, I'm thinking, I don't know, maybe late 50s, early 60s. I've never met her. She says, I don't understand it. She's slender. She eats really healthfully. And then I went and was was taking care of her daughter. And in the meantime, when I came back later, you said, you know, the last thing she said to me, she said, you know, my mom has terrible periodontal disease. Because mm -hmm. she couldn't understand how her mom could have had this heart attack. Right. And so it's just, you know, just, it's all over us every day. That's exactly right. And we hope to change the conversation at cocktail parties or uh, around the water cooler at work. Uh, everybody's still focused on, did you pass your latest stress test and how was your last cholesterol level? But the conversation needs to be, have you looked inside to see if your arteries are healthy? Do you have inflammation? Have you been to the dentist? Do you know if you have periodontal disease, et cetera? So, yeah, regardless of what you look like, right? Yeah. Even if you're incredibly fit. So what is inflammation and how do we measure it? We have great tools and they're very simple and very inexpensive to understand clearly if someone has inflammation in the arteries, which as we said, is the cause of heart attack and stroke. So there's two urine tests and uh, four blood and serum tests, just so simple blood draw, simple urine collection, and we have everything we need to know about inflammatory uh, risk of heart attack and stroke. I put a highlight by the ones that are absolutely essential, uh, the, the most telling, if you will. Microalbumin creatinine ratio, a urine test, tells us if uh, cholesterol is allowed to go through the lining of the artery. Uh, we call that the endothelial lining. We'll talk a little more about that. F2 isoprostane tells us if you're aging too rapidly, uh, oxidative stress, if you're familiar with that term. And then lipoprotein-associated phospholipase A2, LP plaque 2, simple blood test, tells if that's elevated, we know that there is inflammation in the wall of the artery that's active. This process of plaque buildup and cholesterol in the wall of the artery is a very dynamic process along miles and miles of blood vessels. And um, so if plaque two is elevated somewhere in that arterial system, there's something uh, fixing to, a good fixing, that's a Texas term. <laughs> it's going to, that's going to rupture. In other words, small areas of plaque uh, are like little blisters or little pimples on the wall of the artery and you want to stabilize those. 
if uh, L plaque two as well as MPO are elevated, then it's much more likely vulnerable to break open like a volcano. Myeloprostase is another dangerous one. So these are important because as we talk more, we have these conversations. Well, I'm seeing an elevation in either one of these two, and so could there be an oral source? Or you're saying, I'm seeing something in the mouth, what do inflammatory markers look like? So to be able to have that conversation real time with the patient, you know, this is life-saving. C-reactive protein is one we all hear about much more often, but it's a global marker of inflammation. A lot of things make C-reactive protein go up, so it's really not as specific, but can be very helpful. And then ADMA is uh, the last one, and it's an important blood test. It's a newer blood test, but it's inversely related to something called nitric oxide, which Victor will talk about more. But again, it demonstrates the fact that an oral component uh, is involved when nitric oxide is low. So if we're not working with the dentist, that's just one of the sources of inflammation that we're far better uh, at treating it. Not far better, we can't treat it unless the dental team is involved. So one of the things that's changed for me is it's, it's still the same disease recognition. I'm still looking to somebody have periodontal disease, bone loss, airway issues, sleep apnea, dental abscesses, but now my head goes, I wonder if they have atherosclerosis, and I wonder what their inflammatory markers are. And, and because it would give me a different level of urgency and message to the patient that, hey, yeah, you've got an abscess tooth, and on top of it, you have cardiovascular disease, have myeloperoxidase elevated, you're really in a danger zone. I don't know that unless they're part of both, working with both of us. So this is just an example of a lab printout. The myeloperoxidase and plaque 2 we list first because we want to know right away if there's a problem with those two, this individual, and there is not. If it's in green, it's under the cut points, and so no inflammation in the wall of the artery. Uh, and then C-reactive protein, as you can see, is slightly elevated, and then the microalbumin creatinine ratio is elevated too uh, at 11, which is for females, we want it below 7.5. So what we can tell about this individual is that lining of the artery is either cracked or it's, it's unhealthy, it's permeable, cholesterol can more easily get through, which is a dangerous situation as well. So uh, we have conversations about the root causes of that, the sources of that, uh, and treat them collaboratively together. This is AM, ADMA, asymmetric dimethyl arginine we talked about, normal for this patient, and then F2 isoprostane. Uh, this tells us uh, that this individual has a pretty healthy lifestyle for f 2 prostate to be low. So when you get the inflammatory markers, wh what does that really mean? It means, this is, this is a cross section of the wall of an artery, three different ones, obviously. And so the wall of the artery in this picture, we can tell that it's somewhat diseased, but the plaque, the cholesterol buildup that sits there was right here, is right here. So you can see that this individual, before they had their heart attack, this is taken from an individual at, after they had a heart attack, at the site of the heart attack. And so the endothelial lining that we've been talking about cracked or ruptured. Remember that blister I was talking about? Blister ruptured. And the contents flowing out into the bloodstream prompted the body to send in an immune response and put a blood clot on that crack. And the blood clot was so aggressive that it filled the entire lumen or pipe and boom, heart attack, because it's the blood clot that blocks the flow of blood, not the plaque buildup. So this gentleman would have passed a stress test yesterday or this morning because he did not have problem with blood flow, but he had a vulnerable lesion that if nobody was looking for the presence of that lesion and nobody was looking for inflammation, Obviously, he didn't know, and he wouldn't know, but we have ways to look for this now and know if anything like that is brewing, so to speak, so, in your body. So, Gina, just a couple of things to make sure. So, this is the lumen or the, or the, the hole through which the blood is flowing, mm -hmm. and then when we talk about CIMT ultrasound test, mm -hmm. we're looking not here where blood is flowing. We're looking in the wall to see if we see any plaque, and that plaque could either be calcified or it could be soft plaque. Both can be picked up with an ultrasound, and then you'll talk about another test that right. our radiology uh, friends do, coronary calcium score, right. where they'll pick up calcified plaque. But exactly. So just 
just wanted to make sure everybody understood that picture. Yes, thank you. That's right. Is that clear? <clears throat> Pretty clear. Okay. And this is just another example of that. So you can see this is where the flak was before the gentleman had a heart attack, and this is where the crack occurred, or the rupture, and so this clot has filled the entire hole. Boom, blood flow is stopped immediately. So if this occurs in an artery in the heart, we call it a heart attack, or we call it sudden cardiac death. Uh, if it occurs in a carotid artery that gives the blood supply to the brain, then it's a stroke. But this can occur in the blood supply to the kidneys, and it and you lose a kidney or you have chronic kidney disease, go on dialysis, it can occur in the blood flow to the legs. So whatever vessel this inflammatory uh, response occurs in, that's where you're gonna have a problem down the road. And so this <laughs> can occur on a small level, day after day after day, where you don't get the big heart attack or the big stroke, but little clots are going downstream and clogging the microvasculature in the brain. And that's what leads to dementia. So reversing this process also reduces the risk of dementia. Um, and this is another example. And here, there is absolutely no plaque, but this is what we call an erosive th thrombus. Uh, it's another uh, uh, way that the uh, artery wall can lead to thrombus formation. But just three uh, examples of the fact that plaque does not just build up over time, and it's the plaque that ultimately blocks that pipe or blocks the lumen. No, these small plaques are the most dangerous. Remember how I said I heard this in 2009 when I first heard Dr. Bell and Dr. Domine speak? I'm like, really? And, and now I realize we did learn that in nursing school, but we were so focused on acute disease, so overburdened, if you will, with people that incredibly sick that we really just lost sight of the fact that, hey, we can do something about this before we have to meet them in the emergency room. So how do we detect it? We've alluded to it a little bit. So this is the arterial system. And uh, as I said, these are the blood vessels that give the blood supply to the entire body after it's been to the heart and lungs to receive nutrients and oxygen. And the easiest way to take a peek, if you will, into the arterial system is simply to put an ultrasound probe on the neck and look at the carotid artery that gives the blood supply to the brain. Um, with this uh, ultrasound, what are we looking for? We're looking for uh, any plaque buildup in the wall of the artery. We want to know if this artery wall is perfectly healthy. So it's a comprehensive assessment of the wall of the artery first. We do look at flow, but we're most interested in knowing is this thin or is there evidence of plaque buildup? Uh, does it meet the criteria for plaque? And if so, is there uh, an ooey gooey mess in there, kind of like the middle of the blister I was talking about. If so, that's the highest risk, the highest type of lesion. So we carefully scrutinize the wall of the artery using what we call CIMT, C stands for carotid, intima media thickness test. Uh, so we, the intima, this gray area, is where cholesterol and plant lives if you have it in the arterial system. Um, this is an example of the conventional carotid Doppler study versus the CIMT ultrasound study. So arteriology is the focus on the artery wall, so the study of the artery. So uh, Amy Domin coined that term to say luminology, looking at the pipe or the lumen is what we've done for so many years. Uh, using Doppler flow ultrasound, measuring flow velocities. That tells us, obviously, if there's an obstruction, but remember those first pictures we saw? They, that resulted in a heart attack and a flow velocity study would have been normal. But when we focus on the wall, we can see that we would have totally missed this potentially dangerous lesion in the wall of the artery. Um, so if you hear somebody that says, well, I've had that test, I've had an ultrasound test of the carotids, they may or may not have had an evaluation of the wall of the artery. It uses B-mode ultrasound uh, assessing the structure. And we look with, at the flow velocities as well. But the conventional Doppler done most often uh, is a flow study. So I think it's really important because, you know, as a dentist, I've asked people and most people don't know, so they've had ultrasound that was on their neck, and so they're thinking that they had a CIMT, and most of the time what they've had is a, a flow study. Now, how do I know that? 
is because the first two years, up until recently, we every time Gene was in, we would have to fly in somebody who was certified to do CIMT ultrasound, meaning there was nobody that we could find, well known people, know these people, nobody in the New York tri-state area that does a CIMT. Now, thank goodness, my daughter Sydney became certified through uh, cardio risk in Utah, and, and so, um, so we're able to do it right here. But it's a significantly simple test that is so diagnostic and to pick up early disease. Just go to the next slide here. Right. So I, I put this up because this on the <clears throat> right side is as if somebody took a slice right through the middle of my two teeth, the middle of my nose, and you're looking in at the side. And so this actually is the front tooth, the lower tooth, the nose, and this is the airway. So the airway starting from the nose going all the way down. Um, and so that's a pretty wide airway. Yet in the uh, sleep world, if I looked at that airway and said, hey, they don't have sleep apnea or they don't have a sleep disorder, I would be thrown out of both the medical community and the dental community because everybody knows you can't just look at an x-ray and say, hey, the flow is good, they don't have a problem. And yet I find in the cardiology world that it seems like a lot of times people have a good flow here and they say they're fine. The truth of the matter, unless you look deeper to see if there's plaque in the walls, you don't know. And unless you look deeper to see if soft tissue is collapsing and other things, you don't know. So both of these, luminology and a CT scan, show the airway, show the blood vessel, whether it's open or closed and flowing, but they're not diagnostic alone. And so I just want people to be educated that that can be darn misleading. And in fact, in my mom's case, they said, hey, you're not 70% blocked, so you're not ready for a procedure yet. And I'm like, now knowing what I, I knew then, 70% blocked, 60% blocked, she had so much disease, and yet that community is treating disease people, and she wasn't diseased enough to get in the front row to get a procedure. So um, talk about, this is another one. So many people say, well, I had a stress test, and I you know, passed with flying colors, I must be fine. In fact, again, personally, after my mom had bypass surgery, I went to her cardiologist, and what did he do? He did a stress test. Mm -hmm. Right. I was 20, I don't know, 28, 29. Yeah, and since we know that stress tests rarely pick up these small areas of plaque, the stress test is designed to uh, be at, at fi abnormal findings when there's a 70, 75, 80, 85 percent blockage, 90 percent blockage. Uh, these lesions that are small and dangerous, remember that we saw earlier, would be totally missed. So this is how someone can pass a stress test and have a heart attack the, later that day, or pass a stress test and have a heart attack when they're walking out to the parking lot from having the stress test. And we did see it in the hospital more often than you would think. Or somebody comes back in three months and said, I just passed a stress test. I was gonna have another one next year. How can this happen? Well, you all know now that it's from those small areas of plaque that had not been identified or treated. So 86% of heart attacks occur because of those small little lesions. That's how important it is to look for them. So clearly, Gina, that's not the right test that's for right. early detection. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. This is a study which uh, tells us, okay, it's a fascinating study. You remember when I said I came out of nursing school in the late 1980s? Uh, and coronary stents were just going to come on the scene. At that same time, some forward-thinking researchers were saying, we've got this technology, ultrasound technology, but we don't know really well how to use it in the vasculature. What is going to be most helpful for us if we use ultrasound to look at blood vessels? So that they said, we're going to take 10,000 healthy people, and we're going to look at the carotid artery that we just looked at earlier, and we're going to look at the femoral artery that gives the blood supply to the legs. And all we're going to do is document what we see. And no matter what we find, these individuals are going to sign something saying, we will, we will not take any treatment. It couldn't be repeated today. It's one reason it's such a great study that gives us important information. Back in the late 1980s, early 1990s, we didn't have the things to offer today. We didn't have coronary stents. Coronary bypass graft surgery was reserved for few people because it was you know, more involved procedure then. Um, we didn't have the medications that we have today. So how they got people to sign up for it, I don't know, but they did make it to 10,000. Remember, these were healthy people. 
age 35 <coughs> to 65, people like us in this room, people listening that are healthy, um, no blood, high blood pressure, non-smokers, did not have diabetes, people that you would not think would be likely to have a heart attack or stroke, followed them for 10 years and just kept documenting what they see in the carotid and femoral arteries. What they found is if the artery wall, not the flow necessarily at all, analyzing the artery wall with B-mode ultrasound was normal, 0.1% likely to have a heart attack or stroke in the next 10 years. If there was thickness, not clear cut evidence, of atherosclerotic plaque, but not a perfectly healthy artery either. Something that measured greater than one millimeter, 8.7% likely to have a heart attack or stroke. But if they had evidence of atherosclerotic plaque, albeit small and non-flow limiting, those individuals, healthy, age 35 to 65, were 39.1% or 40% likely to have a heart attack or stroke in the next 10 years. So that was a game changer. Uh, an eye opener, if you will. We still use it today because using these scoring systems to say, oh, you're such and such year old male and you, you know, do you, what's your cholesterol, what's your blood pressure, do you smoke, uh, even do you have diabetes, doesn't appropriately risk stratify people. We've had study after study since this one, even as recently as 2017 and 18, confirming the fact that we must use these tools like B-mode ultrasound to look for what we call subclinical atherosclerosis before you have symptoms. It's there, but you wouldn't know it unless you went and looked. So someone uh, with a low risk based on being healthy and having a low risk score, uh, once you look for disease, it totally changes the game. Then they need to you can appropriately apply, apply treatment. And then, of course, if they do have so much disease that it's obstructing the flow of blood, 81.1% likely to have a heart attack or stroke in the next 10 years. So, Gina, you and I have 18 minutes left, so we've got to be mindful. Well, okay. So, just the next two studies demonstrate the fact that the method that we're talking about today has scientific evidence behind it that it that, that applying these treatments working collaboratively does through decreasing inflammation re improves the health of the artery wall we have retrospective five-year data and three-year data and in fact if you'll go to the next slide uh, after the first study was done demonstrating reduction in that plaque 2 you remember that inflammatory marker that i said is quite dangerous reduction in plaque two and improvement stabilization of atherosclerosis on the artery wall uh, <laughs> The researchers at John Hopkins University wanted to analyze the, the data even deeper and say, what was it on the ultrasound that was the most predictive of heart attack and stroke? And indeed, the greatest predictor was the amount of lipid in the plaque, meaning that blister was full of, for lack of a better way to describe it, just an ooey gooey substance or a liquidy substance that was very likely to rupture uh, if inflammation was present. So we need to reduce the, the lipid rich core reduce the presence of atherosclerosis over time. But it's something that we can do. So that. just the concept that cardiovascular disease is reversible, mm -hmm. you know, you're too close to this. Mm -hmm. I don't, I didn't know that. I thought once you have disease, you know, you're a ticking time bomb. So just, it is reversible, yes. but it takes a comprehensive approach. That's exactly right. Talk about the coronary artery calcium score. Yeah, so the coronary artery calcium score is a fantastic test because we know this is a, a finding that a lot of people don't know. We're getting a, a, doing a lot better getting the message out. But calcium, the presence of calcium in an artery anywhere is diagnostic for vascular disease. You have atherosclerosis if you have calcification in an artery. So we can see calcification present, kind of an incidental finding, if you will, on an aortogram, on a, a female that has a mammogram, or a male that has a mammogram. On a dental x-ray. On a dental x-ray, exactly. So. Uh, the technology to look at calcium in the coronary arteries is particularly helpful because we get a score to identify how much calcium and studies have been done to demonstrate the fact that just knowing that the presence of disease is there, we know increases your risk 40% so we can more appropriately risk stratify you and apply treatment. Uh, but the important thing to know about the coronary artery calcium score is if it's negative, if you get a zero score, uh, that doesn't mean you don't have atherosclerosis because it only looks at calcified plaque. So if you have some soft plaque that's still blister-like that hasn't calcified or hasn't gotten a thickened covering, uh, then you could go away with a false sense of security. So simply the protocol for looking for disease, because that's the first thing, you know, you want to know as a person, do I have cardiovascular disease or not? You do a CIMT. If that shows plaque that's greater than 1.3, 
you don't need to look further, you have atherosclerosis. But if that's negative and you're above 45 or you have other risk factors of which there's a long litany, then you would go and have a coronary calcium score. If both of those are negative, you're in great shape. But you need to do that. You need to do a CIMT, and if you then need a deeper look, coronary yeah. calcium score. Right, or if you've had a coronary calcium score, you need to also get a, um, a CIMT CIMT. because it's the best thing to monitor uh, is the disease process getting better. Right, because there's too much radiation that you don't want to continually uh, repeat the, car the coronary artery right. calcium score, whereas with the ultrasound, you could do it yearly to monitor reversal improvement. This is just briefly just a, a dental x-rays. They did a study, 77 males, um, that showed carotid calcification, and 26% had a cardiovascular back, meaning a stroke or heart attack within three and a half years. Um, yeah, so moving on to really your portion of the uh, talk quickly, Victor, this is another diagram demonstrating the power of the bail domain method in heart attack and stroke, dementia, and diabetes prevention. So if these branches of the tree are our, our arteries, are our arteries healthy? Are they a little bit thickened or do we have something scary going on? So first thing to look at, as you just said, Inflammation is the driver of all disease, so assessing for inflammation. And then the detective work begins. The real collaborative work begins to identify what are the root causes or the sources of that inflammation that led to the atherosclerosis. And so we have many things. Of course, cholesterol plays a role. Uh, high blood pressure plays a role. There's a, a dysfunctional, a genetically uh, inherited dysfunctional type of LDL cholesterol called LP little a that is a root cause that's not routinely measured. Psychosocial issues is number three on the list in terms of risk factor for heart attack and stroke. So we need to understand that. Anyway, you can see that there are new root causes yet to be identified, but endodontic disease, periodontal disease, obstructive sleep apnea, insulin resistance, gut dysbiosis, infectious disease. But if you would hit the next button, please, look how many of these are related to oral health and to airway health. So that's why I say the medical community, physicians, nurse practitioners, MD, DO, PAs, cannot totally protect someone or help reduce your risk of heart attack and stroke uh, without collaborating with them. So I recognize that we've been looking at sources of inflammation for years. I mean, this slide here is showing somebody that has significant acid reflux. So there's no decay, but the teeth are eroding away. This is somebody that's been grinding and clenching, as well as having acid reflux. And the grinding and clenching we know now is, and in this case, he's got confirmed sleep apnea. We did not know it back then, about 20 years ago. Um, this is somebody that has periodontal disease, dental decay, these are dental decay, endodontic abscesses. So this is the world that dentists, general dentists live in. And so we're seeing this inflammation all the time. 75% of the population has periodontal disease. But here's the paradigm shift for, for, for dentistry is that all dentists are trained to recognize this. Teeth splaying apart, visible tartar, calculus, loose teeth, bone loss. But this is what we were taught is health, pink gum tissue, no recession. However, um, we now know that when people have periodontal disease that there's bacteria that can be identified. We're now doing salivary tests where we take a swab and we swab the tongue, we swab around the teeth, we take little points and go into five different pockets around the teeth and we send them off to a lab and we get, and there's about three different labs that I'm aware of that are doing this, and we'll get anywhere from nine to 11 uh, bacteria and what kind of load. So in this case, uh, you know, these are high, high loads of these bacteria. These bacteria have long, fancy names. But the important thing as well is that these first four, this one, Fusobacteria nucleatum, are significant for heart attack and stroke. In fact, we now know that they're causative of the initiation and progression of heart disease. And so now all of a sudden, from changing my mind is set is different. I'm not just trying to help people save their teeth. I'm like, wow, that person has a significant chance of losing their life. Now this is interesting because, um, you know, dentists have not up until this point really been invited to this party of saving people's health. So for the lay people to say this is so obvious, for the medical and dental community, I'm telling you, this messes with us. You know, this is like two different. So the consensus statement from the American Journal of Periodontology and Periodontology, the study of gum disease, 
they had come out and said that a doctor should warn patients with moderate to severe gum disease of potential cardiovascular risk. Uh, patients with gum disease should have a complete physical annually. Uh, they should be checked for diabetes, high cholesterol. So basically what it's saying, hey, if you see gum disease, we know these people should be referred. So it's in our collaborative uh, organizations that this should be done. And here's a study that just showed that, um, uh, let's see, periodontal disease shows the progression. Yeah, is that um, when they treated people, they had over almost 5,300 people, and people that responded to periodontal treatment got healthier, they had 28% lower risk of having an event. So that we know when you reduce inflammation, that was what was happening. And so, but here's what really changed for me. So this is the picture of health. There's no fillings, there's some spots on the camera. Um, there's no periodontal disease, there's no bleeding, there's no pockets, the bone loss around the teeth, the bone around the teeth is phenomenal. Yet when we do a salivary diagnostic, we have high-risk pathogens. We have four of the five possible high-risk pathogens. Uh, this happens to be one of my three daughters. Both her parents, Kim and I have atherosclerosis, and she's had three out of four grandparents uh, die of cardiovascular disease. So that's not to be taken lightly anymore. And yet, by the way, most of the world is living here and saying, we'll see you in six months, there's nothing important going on here. And so uh, just want to just quickly re refresh is that there's this thing called the atherogenic triad that uh, Brad Bell and Amy Donin have written and published about, but there's a whole cascade of biomechanical mechanisms by which plaque um, and, and cholesterol and bad lipoproteins accumulate in much greater concentrations. And then if the wall gets permeable, they work their way into the wall and they get trapped there, as well as these bacteria that you just saw in that salivary diagnostics. So that we know that when you have high loads of these bad bacteria, you're causing the initiation and progression of plaque getting into and getting trapped and causing them to rupture. So it's a significant piece. And so this kind of sums it up. This is no longer to be taken as a sign of health unless you know what's going on on a microbiological scale, and then it can affect this. And then if my conversation with Gina is, hey, Gina, what does the inflammatory markers look like? And she says, hey, they're high. Well, then it, it's causative for me to take greater action, and we have to actually do therapy on somebody that would have flown below the radar um, for 31 years of my career, or 30 years of my 32. And dental caries and dental abscesses, again, they're part of the, the dental world. And But now we have sophisticated technology. This is a CBCT. The only point of it is that we can look millimeter by millimeter, and we know that a CBCT is 96% accurate for picking up dental infections, where when we take 2D x-rays, which is the traditional 73% accurate, so that you're going to almost miss 25% of infection if you don't have a CBCT. And so, yeah, we have a CBCT because when Gina says, hey, the inflammatory markers are high, is there anything going on? I know that I can't necessarily see it all the way with this. Um, the other thing is there's a study, uh, 101 people that were in the throes of a heart attack. Again, I don't know how they do it. But then when they looked at the clot that caused the heart attack, they had 16 times greater concentration of dental microbes in that plaque, those ones that you're seeing on that salivary test. 75% came from root canal abscesses, 35% from periodontal disease. And so the conclusion was that 50% of heart attacks may be triggered by dental infection. And you'd think that, well, don't people know they have an infection? They don't. Many dental abscesses are absolutely silent. We can only pick it up on a CBCT or a dental x-ray, but CBCT is more accurate. The last piece is, is one that... Uh, interests me so much, and it's all about airway. Uh, they, one study says that up to 40% of the people in our country might have airway disease or sleep apnea, of which is, is one of several. And so just diagrammatically, nose, mouth, this is the airway down to the lungs. When the tongue is forward and the lower jaw is forward and the nose is clear, the air can flow well. But if we go over there, you need to just point to where the obstruction is. If the lower jaw is back or the tongue is back because of a tongue tie or tongue doesn't have enough room in the mouth, then it can obstruct. 
And so, uh, Kim, I just want to show this video because snoring is something we've kind of made fun of in this country. Um, and it's really a significant uh, precursor or indicator of disease. And so this comes from um, Saroosh Zaghi, who's a very talented um, ENT in California and a, quite an educator. So we're going to play this for about a minute. It'll be well worthwhile. Yeah, he's having a sleep endoscopy. He put the sleep and then look down his throat. It'll start to make sense. That's the patient snoring. This is, I think, a 23 year old patient who nobody believed had any sleep issues. On his sleep study, it came out mild sleep apnea. So they're putting the scope down his nose, looking at the airway, and that was collapsing. They turn the jaw forward to see if that improves things by opening the airway. Those legs that he doesn't know, he's sleeping. That's the voluntary movement of those legs. So he can't breathe. Just want you to just hear. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Just Austin goes on to say that he was so relieved to have somebody affirm what he's been feeling because the, the kid is exhausted and can't concentrate, and yet the sleep study said he's fine. I'm not saying that sleep studies are bad, but it's a diagnostic tool. Sometimes you go for a sleep study and you know, you're a little nervous about being in the sleep center, and it can be a distorted perspective. And it's hard to necessarily do it three nights in a row because insurance doesn't cover it. But um, so heavy snoring increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. Mild snoring, 20%, 32% with moderate snoring, and 64% with heavy snoring have cardiovascular disease. It's not just something cute. This is just important. I just got to start. The American Medical Association and the American Academy of Sleep Medicine have recently come out and said a new nationwide initiative to defend the scope of practice of physicians and advanced care providers who manage patients with obstructive sleep apnea from encroachment by dentists and other practitioners who are not trained or qualified to diagnose a medical disease. This is recent. They don't want dentists being a part of it, which is odd, because here the American Dental Association policy statement is that dentists are encouraged to screen patients with sleep-disordered breathing. So you think the professions are confused, we are. The truth of the matter is we're seeing patients, and you'll see why we are perfect to make the referral. No, I don't want to make the diagnosis of upper air resistance syndrome or sleep apnea. But boy, I have a great idea that somebody is sick and I'll make that referral. And so uh, this is just the point. There's so many studies that are supporting that sleep apnea and breathing and airway restriction during the evening. It, it increases blood pressure. It makes it harder to stabilize blood pressure. So how many people you know that are on this blood pressure medication and that? And nobody's looking at their sleep. That could be the underlying root cause. Uh, we know when, when, when you're not sleeping well, it's like somebody's got their, their hands around your neck, and so all of a sudden, it's like you're under fight or flight mode, and so there's anxiety, depression, uh, ADHD, grinding, clenching, TMD, bedwetting, acid reflux, all these chronic diseases uh, are, are, can be have a, as their underlying cause, obstructive sleep apnea and upper airway resistance syndrome. Um, and so we know clearly that sleep apnea increases cardiovascular disease risk, but upper airway resistance syndrome is the person, if that's the thin woman who doesn't look like she has any airway problems and yet significantly has um, tremendous effort to breathe during night, which is waking them up from proper restful sleep. And so just uh, at, at CT scan, this is showing a great airway and this is showing, these I just took in my practice this week, and this is showing somebody that has a significantly smaller airway. And so dentists need to be a part of it because I can make the referral. Now, I don't know that this person, in fact, uh, he's a 70-year-old man suffering, who had a stroke and is in a wheelchair, and this is a 33-year-old woman. 
she has already been diagnosed with sleep apnea. And so we can't be diagnostic who has it and who doesn't, but I certainly have my ears up for this person, even if she didn't tell me she already had it. And as I get to the closure, there's so much the dental world is doing with sleep. In other words, this is a little boy who has difficulty bringing his lips together. So myofunctional therapists are working with people like that to help them become nasal breathers. And the orthodontic community, and he's somebody I'm treating, is bringing the upper and lower jaw forward at young ages to change their profile, to change their airway. Here's somebody that's tilting their head back to make sure that they can get air. He's uh, 12 years old, I think, at the time. Crowded teeth, they're a symptom of airway issues. They're not something to be straightened. They're something to be, hey, there's a red flag. We've got somebody that's got too small a mouth, not enough room for the tongue, at great risk. And so if all of a sudden you treat this by extracting teeth and keeping that arch small and not enough room for the tongue, you have forced them potentially into a, a life-threatening situation. And that's why people like Greg Campy here are no longer extracting teeth. We're not only expanding these people so there's room for their tongue and their teeth, we're actually then reopening extraction spaces. And Bill Hang has really been the leader in teaching them about that. People with narrow palates, people with showing that they're grinding and clenching, these are things that the dentists are seeing so that we can be better referrers. Because airway kills because it causes heart disease, and we know it. And so just as we conclude, just uh, my heart about this thing is how do people in the dental and medical community get involved? I think the first step is you got to become a patient. If you don't go through a bail do need assessment and understand what comprehensive care is like, it's very hard to take your patients there. And Gina, you have kind of a, a besides your clinical practice, what you're hoping to Yes, accomplish. so beside the passion for bringing heart attack and stroke off the number one killer spot, and of course saving the life of that one individual that's there in front of me, my passion is also to bring these collaborations together. We need so many more. Our goal is to have, first of all, a thousand trained dental teams and a thousand highly trained medical teams collaborating together across the United States and the world to provide this kind of care. And then once we get to a thousand, our next goal is 10,000. The only way that we're going to make a dent in this and continue to save lives is to uh, collaborate and increase our numbers. So after you get a workup on yourself, or while you're getting a workup on yourself, you can understand, okay, I can see now how I'm going to implement this into my practice. And as uh, the clinical program director for the Beldoni Method, we have several opportunities to be able to uh, become expert. Uh, and you said many times, it's a source of frustration when physicians and nurse practitioners and PAs don't have a dentist that understands the depth they need to look for inflammation. And likewise, I was that dentist who was so much looking for a healthcare provider to come alongside me so that when I made the referral, they would take it seriously and look deep what the underlying cause, do they have disease, do they have inflammation, and, and work with that patient to find the underlying cause. So, um, so true to this, I just want you to know that we actually are doing what we say. So this, we run CIMT days here almost every month. That's my daughter, Sydney. She was working, I guess, down in Dallas. Dallas. But uh, this Saturday, uh, some are signed up. Others that need CIMTs, come see us uh, so we can take that first step to identify whether or not you have disease. Um, these are the folks we thanked in the beginning. We really appreciate your inviting us to be a part of uh, part of your collaborative world. For and sure. I know you want to talk about. Yeah, so in addition to those courses above, in your email, you'll get more information about, as a healthcare provider, how to. Um, how to embrace this into your practice, how to implement into your practice, and whether you're a healthcare provider or not, how to uh, get started as a patient. But upcoming uh, with the Baldoni Method, we have the preceptorship, which is in September in Orlando. It's a two-day course uh, that it presents exactly what we've talked, tried to talk about in less than an hour. Right, today. so they spent two days, and, and all healthcare people are welcome. I've been That's to two. Sydney came with me uh, in Atlanta in November, so it's a great conference. It's heavy about you know all the studies that are supporting what male donees are doing right. to reverse heart disease. Right, absolutely. And then of course the reunion for those who've been through a preceptorship in September. And then there are other opportunities as well, which you'll get in the email, but you can stay current with the science, learn how to implement this method in your practice and enhance your collaboration efforts through these programs uh, that Bell Levine 
offers, but first and foremost, get a workup on yourself. And there is a way that we do that where you can get the workup on yourself, but you as the patient, we also take you through the learning process so you can see how this would work in your practice and how it would work in your collaboration. Great. Thanks, Gina. Thanks, everybody here. Yes. And, uh, appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. Yes. Andy, do you have any questions? We'll be honest. And are there any questions here? I know we covered a lot fast, but we stayed the whole time. Fantastic. I, I could leave. <laughs> <laughs> right. I have a question. Go ahead, Lisa. You spoke about the calcifications on a mammogram. Mm -hmm. In the uh, Sorry, go ahead. Is that, a, is that a risk factor? Is that being looked at? It is. It definitely is. It's a risk factor in that if it's in the mammary artery. So calcifications in the mammary artery is atherosclerosis, just like calcifications in any other artery. Not in, not in the tissue. Okay. Right. I uh, didn't elaborate enough in the artery. Yes. Thank you. Anything else? I don't have a question. Um, I just want to say, um, this has brought to light to me so much that um, I didn't understand with my family situation. <laughs> my grandmother died of a stroke, my aunt died of a stroke, my mother had a stroke and then eventually her heart gave out. We say, oh, it's genetic. But of course, um, looking at the, the collaboration of the dentist and the medical side of it, I realized that um, they were very lax about dental um, care mm -hmm. because of where we lived we were in boondocks if it, if some people would say mm -hmm. because um and it was difficult for them to get to the dentist on a constant basis mm -hmm. so okay they brushed and they did and they did but they never really had any kind of in-depth examination of their so that for me has brought to light I used to be questioning why the heck didn't this happen? Why didn't they do this? Why didn't they? But now I realize what it was all about. You know? yeah. They had probably had no um, no insight into what was going on in their in their general health that took them in that fashion. Right. And 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 I would say right now the people in this room, I mean, you know more about it than than most. In, in our communities, in our professional communities, and you know they they kind of know pretty much their area really well. But to step outside and and understand, I don't want to be a, I don't want to practice cardiovascular medicine, but I need to know enough to make a good referral and to recognize disease or red flags. And if we're going to take blood pressures, why can't we have CIMT days and help more of our patients pick it up early? And, and so education is key, and it's very affirming. Appreciate uh -huh. that. Ray, any other any questions that you want us to answer? Actually, uh, we do have one question here, um, and that is, could you please go over how to collect an oral culture to test for pathogens? Well, we'll make sure that we include that, uh, both oral vital and oral DNA that I've used. Uh, they love uh, to teach it. And so, but basically, it, it's a very simple kit they send you where you take a swab, you swab the tongue, you swab behind the lower teeth, you swab behind the upper teeth, and then you take paper points. That's the oral vital. Oral DNA, you take a little salt water, you swish it in your mouth for, I think, 30 seconds, spit out into a collection tube, and you send that off. So they're both rather simple, um, simple tests. Hope that helps. Timmy, you got a question? No, I mean, we've gone to the stress test and haven't had one or two in my lifetime. And as you've said, you know, where you would experience people walking out and then next thing you know, they're turning around where something happened. Right. Are they becoming almost obsolete where you should almost bypass the stress test and mm -hmm. not make it obsolete? I know there's some medical, right. but having known that fact when they put me to a point where I thought I was going to drop and, right. you know, and... Is it obsolete or is it so just with all this other obsolete. scientific yeah. information and can it be bypassed? No pun intended. <laughs> uh, but. Yeah. I wouldn't say it's obsolete because it does give us a lot of good diagnostic right. data on what we're seeing on the EKG, the person's exercise capacity, and if it's combined with imaging, some okay. 
uh, information about function of the heart. It's not obsolete, but it needs to be used appropriately. You need to know, you know, what you're looking for and why you're doing the test. So certainly we are seeing and will see in greater numbers reductions of stress tests on an annual basis for somebody that's not even having symptoms for this very disease. Right. And that's been uh, thought leaders in the world of cardiology are, you see that in the scientific literature. So if you're diagnosed with plaque in your arteries, what are you supposed to do? So that's where the detective works begins. We need to know is there inflammation as well? And we need to focus our efforts at reducing inflammation or whether there is or not inflammation, we need to identify those sources of atherosclerosis, those root causes underneath that tree. So we do a comprehensive blood and urine test as well as genetic testing and the uh, dental workup to uncover all of those roots under the tree. And once we see what your root causes are, then we have a, an aggressive lifestyle recommendation in terms of, and, as well as supplements and medications for example, you know, if you have sleep disorder breathing or sleep uh, apnea, then that plaque is not going to look better in a year or two years or three years. Uh, we're not going to be able to reverse disease unless you get that treated. So it's identifying the root causes with a comprehensive evaluation and then working collaboratively to reverse those root causes. Then the other thing, I think it's, it's not a, it's an ongoing because the body's dynamic. So personally as a patient, so I do, not all the blood work, but I do the inflammatory markers on a three month basis because it could change. It could change because of something I've changed typically in my lifestyle and all of a sudden something's out. So you're trying to keep a closer eye on inflammation. So inflammation is your speedometer. It's telling you, are you in the danger zone or not? So if you've got a disease, if you're not inflamed, you're, you're moving towards stability and reversal. So disease is important to know, but it doesn't mean game over. It just means, okay, now am I hot or not? And if you're not hot, just stay cool and you're not going to have an event. Uh, they even give some sort of a, you know, a guarantee that if you had an event while you're part of their patient that year, they'll refund your money. But, I mean, they really believe, they've been doing this a while, that they can help people reverse the disease. Of course, the patient's got to be compliant. And, Martha, you're such a lifestyle person. But, I mean, I love their saying that you can't out-medicate lifestyle. I mean, the big four, exercise, what you're eating, how you're sleeping, and how you're managing stress in your life. Those are the big, those are the big four, and that's the most important thing in terms of stabilizing and reversing the disease. Mm -hmm. However, there are some stopgap measures. I mean, for some people that have disease, a baby aspirin is important, or niacin if you've got a, you know, a certain type of um, genetic profile. So knowing that genetics is really important as well. So it's a, and that's why it is comprehensive and it takes, you know, somebody being kind of like a Sherlock Holmes to be working through it with a person. It doesn't lend itself to the way to seeing a patient every 10 minutes, 15 minutes or 20 minutes. I mean, Lisa is a great nurse practitioner here on Staten Island and, she, and she's not practicing, you know, she's practicing this way of personalized medicine, but I mean, that's what it takes to do it well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, we have another question. Yeah. And that is, we do not have anyone trained to perform CIMT in our area. Where can someone get trained? Would it be an x-ray technician who specializes in ultrasound? So the answer to that is it doesn't have to be. Uh, it can be a vascular certified technician, but just because you're a vascular certified technician doesn't mean that you are um, certified in CIMT, the thorough evaluation of the artery wall. So the, um, the school, if you will, that's setting the, the gold standard high in terms of uh, vascular technicians, certified vascular technicians, and those who are uh, not vascular certified technicians can go to Cardio Risk in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, watch videos and go through some modules ahead of time and then go out there for a three-day intense program after which your scans will be carefully reviewed you'll have ongoing uh, evaluation and uh, and critique and uh, you have to meet a certain criteria for to get a certification and then you also have to recertify every year but that being said uh, we definitely want to stay connected with all of you who have that problem as we're creating a, a larger and larger network so that uh, you can call the bell donating method uh, 
headquarters and find out who is a high, performing a high quality study in your area that has been uh, trained and certified. But it is possible for a, a lifestyle coach, a nurse practitioner, a dental hygienist, a clinical dental assistant, um, a phlebotomist to, if they wanted to, they could go and learn this and we need more people. We do. And, and I mean, Sydney is working towards being a, a lifestyle coach, but we needed desperately to grow a CIMT tech and she really has a gift for it. It's not an easy thing of four people at the time who went through the training, two created, made the certification, two didn't. And it just, you know, you gotta keep doing it and it takes a lot. But on the other hand, it is learnable, it's doable. It's not a crazy long course of study. Um, so you can grow somebody in your community. Right. Great. Great question. Anything else, Randy? I don't. Okay, well, well thank you, Randy. Thank you. Thanks, everybody here. You've been a great audience. Really yes. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.